Okay. Um, before we start, for those of you, I've seen, I saw um, a lot of people, actually, most people have already um, done the quiz or at least opened it and had a look at it. Um, if you sh I had a couple of emails saying, uh, from people saying I can't find the quiz in Moodle. It was right at the top. Um, but now to emphasize it even more, if you look now, there's a big red sentence that says weekly quizzes here. Um, so you can't miss it. Um, I do just want to remind you that the quiz will be open until Monday 9 a.m. You can do it at any time. Um, has anyone experienced any problems attempting the quiz? Okay. Huh? If you don't know how to skip, um, yeah, you can't go, well, you can not answer something, but then you can't go back. That, you can't go back. You have to um, keep going. There's no back button on those quizzes. Um, it is actually something that um, I will, I'm working with the developers of the system. Um, we do need a previous, I mean, uh, um, there's no back button, not because I want to be mean and I don't want you to go back. Um, it's just a limitation of the system. Um, and this is something I will ask them to implement. Um, the, the reason, by the way, just, just so you know, the reason why um, it is the way it is, the system was actually um, developed to be um, for adaptive tutorials. It's, it's a smart system that um, academics can develop um, teaching students in an interactive way um, of different materials. It wasn't really meant to be for assessments, but um, because it's a nice system, it can do a lot of good things. I, um, I adopted it um, for our quizzes. Um, you will see, we will have some more um, interesting quizzes, more interactive ones um, throughout the session. Uh, but we, the system is still under development. That's, this is why I keep asking you, if you experience any bugs, let me know straight away, because we can fix them. Um, and this is the reason for not having a back button, um, which is something I will ask them to add. Um, other than the quizzes, another issue that came to my attention, how many of you are doing um, ELEC 3115 as well as this course? This, well, that, that was my assumption because um, they just scheduled them a lecture at the, this very same time. Um, but, you know, I would, I would have assumed they would come here rather than 3015. Um, I will ask again on Tuesday. Um, hopefully they will be there. Um, Although I, I am trying to um, deal with it, um, so I want to know. All right. Um, I think that's announcements for today. Um, another thing, just before we begin, do you want air, air conditioning on? Yeah. Um, just a mention uh, um, of the Facebook page for this course. Um, I'm quite happy where, um, where this is going. About, I think, half the class um, so sub subscribe to the, uh, to the Facebook. If you haven't done it yet, you may um, do so. There's a link from the Moodle. Um, but I see some students have started posting up links and interesting stories. And this is really the intention, that um, if you find something interesting and you want to share it with the class, Go for it. It doesn't have to be uh, directly related to 2141. Well, it has to be slightly related to, you know, digital computing. Um, don't put the new Lady Gaga video on there. Um, and, and what I would like to do is, is open it for some discussions. Now, if you've been um, following the page lately, and when I say lately, I mean yesterday, um, Goff, one of our lab demonstrators, posted um, an interesting article about the implication of um, GPS vulnerabilities. Um, and how they may apply to so, um, impact society. And this is actually a topic that I've been um, in, in a conference just this last Wednesday um, that this very same topic came up. Now, one of the questions that came up in the, in the conference was whether we as the experts for GPS should go out to the world and tell them, hey, look, your systems are so vulnerable. If anybody wanted to attack your systems, they can do it very easily. Um, you should really protect yourselves. Now, the claims were if we don't go out and publish, that publish it, that there is a problem, that not a lot of people will know that there's a, there's a problem, not a lot of bad guys will know that there's a problem, and then the risk of actually having those attacks 
is minimized. At the same token, if we do, do go out and publish it in the media, and I don't know if you've been following, but there has been, just in the past week, a lot of media cover, coverage about this. Uh, the claim is that if we do go out to the media, then a lot more bad people will know that this is um, possible, and it's very easy, by the way, to attack those systems, but then it will force the companies um, to actually protect themselves because they will know that this is a real risk. Um, I do want opinions about this because in the conference, not right now, um, on the Facebook page, now we, we've got that to cover. Um, but this is something I would like to see from the Facebook page, just discussions um, about various engineering uh, questions, hopefully related to 214, but anything that's um, engineering related would be interesting. Um, so you will see this, this is the latest post about the GPS stuff. Um, there's some information there. Um, if you have an opinion you would like to express it, go for it. Okay, um, that's about this. Any, anything else before we start with lecture? Great, let's go for it. So, uh, what have we done on Tuesday? We learned about Boolean algebra. I introduced to you uh, what binary variables are and we introduce some of the Boolean algebra identities, properties, and, and some nice theorems that you can use to simplify um, your expressions. You will have a lot of um, those kind of exercises in the tutorials. What, sh what may have seen, seem uh, pretty straightforward in the lectures here, I mean those identities look like they're pretty straightforward. Once you come and try to solve the tutorial questions, you might see that it's a bit more complex than what you imagined. Um, the tutorial sheet for next week is actually quite a long one. There's a whole lot of exercises. I do encourage you to go and attempt as many as you can um, and then you'll sort of see what the challenges are and then when you come next week to tutorials, we can actually see how we go about solving those challenges. Now, what we'll cover um, in most of the lecture today are, are what's called standard forms. Um, when you express a linear, or, or sorry, a Boolean um, expression, a function of, um, if you want, we say we have one unique truth table um, to express this function, but we can have many different um, expressions or circuits to implement the very same function. Now, we came up with um, standard forms to express those uh, Boolean expressions that if we use those standard forms, they will actually um, readily lend themselves to implementing simpler or more cost-effective circuits. Now then there comes a, comes a question, how do you actually evaluate a circuit? What, what's the best circuit there is? Um, and this is something we'll talk towards the end of this lecture and we define some um, cost criteria, how we evaluate circuits. Um, okay, so um, a Boolean function is a unique truth table. This is what I just said. And this is actually everything I just said. And let's, let's make some definitions. And, and these are important definitions. Um, mean terms. So a mean term are, well, a mean term is an end gate with every variable present in either true or complement form. That's the dry definition. Um, I'll show you an example if it doesn't quite uh, make sense. But what we really want is that every truth table that we have, we can every, every place, every combination of, um, of variables in this truth table uh, will correspond to a mean term. Now this mean term will be true when the combination is, when we are interested in this combination and will be false otherwise. It's very abstract, let's have a look at an example. Um, so here's a truth table for three variables x, y, and z. We have eight different combinations. Now the mean term is defined to be the product, and when I say product I mean an end product. It's not a mathematical um, multiplication. Um, we do use the word product for um, ending terms as well. So it's an end product of the three variables and there's always going to be all the variable present all the variables present in a mean term, so we will always have all three of them in this case, where every place in the truth table where the variable takes the value zero the, um, in the mean term, it will be complemented. Anywhere that it's a one, it will be non-complemented. So as you can see in the first um, row here, they're all zero, so we will have a product of not x, not y, 
not z. Another example, for example, let's take this one. X and Y come in a true form and Z is a complemented form. We will then have the mean term um, X, Y and not Z. Now if you um, try to evaluate those mean terms, you will realize that each one of those mean terms is equal 1 or takes a truth value only when its corresponding um, combination is fulfilled. So in the example um, here, when we have x, y, not z, this will equal 1 only when x and y are 1 and z is 0. If you try to put any other combination into this uh, mean term, you will get a 0. And this is true for any of them. Now, we will, and I'll show you an example, we can start building functions using those uh, mean terms directly we can um, deduce which mean terms we are interested in from directly from the truth table and therefore uh, we can come with a boolean expression for the function. Now we do give them um, symbol notations for the mean terms and um, it's pretty obvious that um, the symbol is just a small m with a subscript of the corresponding um, decimal number. So if we have a zero, 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 that's decimal zero if we had a 101 one one, for example that's a decimal five um, and this is how we're going to um, number our, our indices. Now if you are observant you will realize then that's when um, order has um, quite an importance because if I shuffled around uh, the order of x, y and z the indices here will no longer correspond to these numbers. If I put z at the front I will get a different combination or a different symbol uh, for these mean terms. We usually, as, as, a, as a convention, we will usually use the alphabetical order of the letters. So we will start um, so from the first um, letter and then go down the alphabet. Um, but we will later, I'll show you in the next slide, I think, one of the next slides, uh, that we can actually specify if, if we um, deviate from this order, we will specify uh, what's the order of um, of our mean terms. So then we have a standard form called a sum of mean terms. And when I say sum, again I don't mean an algebraic sum, I mean a logical sum which is um, terms that are ORed together. So let's take an example and there's, um, there's a function here so I've got all eight combinations for x, y and z. Um, I've got some random function values. This um, function could be anything that I came up with. And we are trying to come up with a, a Boolean expression for this particular function that will take a standard form of sum of mean terms. So what I will do, I will take all the places where my function needs to take the value 1, so it's here, here, here and here, and I will write out the corresponding mean terms for them. So this will be the mean term not x, not y, not z, or um, the, the next one where the function is 1 will be not x, y, not z, or x, not y, z, or the last one x, y, z. Now why does this work? Because um, whenever we have a combination that equals, um, that the function takes the value of 1, at least, well, at most actually, one of these terms will take the 1. So if we have the 1 or 1 combination, this will take the value 1 and then 1 ORed with anything. So we don't care about what the others will be. There will be actually 0. But the function will take the value 1. If we try to use any combination that gives us a zero, none of these terms will actually be evaluated to one, and the whole function will have zero or zero, zero, zero. The function will be zero, and this is why it works. Now we can also express this um, instead of writing um, all the variables, we can actually express it using our symbols, and we can say it equals mean term zero or mean term 2 or mean term 5 or mean term 7. 
Now we said um, these indices actually rely on the order of our variables. In this case, the order was given in the truth table and we don't shuffle it around. Um, but we can have another, um, we can even shortcut this, and this is a shortcut um, notation, and say the function f, and now we will actually define our variables in the right order. So a function f is a function of x, y, and z in this order equals the sum, or um, the logical sum, of mean terms 0, 2, 5, and 7. And this is a shortcut notation that um, we, will, we will use quite a bit. And this expresses directly um, the function in our truth table. In a way, there's a really easy way to go from the truth table here. You pretty much say the function any of any truth table of how many ever variables you've got equals um, the sum of mean terms of the indices where the truth table takes the value of 1. Uh, any questions so far? Cool. So just like we have mean terms, we have the complementary max terms. Now if before we had a sum of um, products, now we will have um, the, the complement of it product of some terms. So or terms are going to be variables that are something um, or with something else. And just like before, um, instead of having a product, we will have some. In this case, however, we are changing um, the definition. The next term will take um, the variable in its true form whenever um, the combination is zero, the, um, the value in the truth table is zero, and it will take the complemented form when it is a one. <coughs> and you can see that in this case now, every max term will take the value zero whenever um, this combination is fulfilled, or it will take the uh, it will take the value one when um, otherwise, when we put in uh, um, any other combination. Just like the mean terms, we do give them symbols as well um, in a similar way according to their order. Um, for max term, we use capital M. And this is how you distinguish between um, mean terms and max terms. Now, in order to um, come up with an um, expression using max terms, this is what we call product of max, excuse me, product of max terms, because now we will um, take some max terms, which are um, or products, and we will, in a way, end them together or multiply them. Um, and such an example would be the function here. Now, in this case, we will take all the places where the function is zero, not a one. And I'll show you, once I write it out, I'll show you why. Um, this is, by the way, the very same function that um, I had before for the other example. But I will look at all the places where my function is zero. And I, re I will read out um, the combination, remembering that um, my variable takes its true form when um, the combination is zero and um, a complementary form when it is a one. So in this case, we'll have x or y or not z ended with x or not y not z ended with not x or y or z or sorry and not x Now we said whenever we um, fulfill the right um, combination, the max term will become a zero. Therefore, if one of them becomes a zero, the whole product becomes a zero and the function goes to zero, which is what we want. 
If you put in any combination that um, is not in one of those max terms, for example, if I put the combination 1, 1, 1, as an example, all of these max terms, they will all evaluate to 1, and then we have a product of four ones, and the function will go to 1. So um, that works. Just like before, we can um, express this as a product of max terms. So it's max term 1, and then max term 3, and max term 4, and max term 6. And on the same token as before, we can have a shortcut notation where we will express the order of the variables. And this time, instead of sum, we'll have a product, so um, <coughs> big pi stands for product, of max terms 1, 3, 4, and 6. Which is the very same um, expression for the same function as before. It's the same truth table, and you can verify it. We will show um, the relationship between uh, min term and max term. In fact, we will do it right now. As a reminder, um, we've done the Morgan's theorem last, um, last lecture, um, and we said x and y complemented is the same as not x or not y. Um, and the equivalent is x or y complemented is the same as not x and not y. And then if we look at um, the mean term and the max terms, so if we say, let's take a two variable example, just like it says there, so we have x and y. And let's have a look at, too much feedback. Um, let's have a look at, um, max term 2. From our definition before, max term 2 will be not x or y. If you look at mean term 2, it will be x and not y. Now according to the Morgan's theorem, we can see that m2 is the complement so max term 2 is the complement of mean term 2. So whenever um, this evaluates to 1, this will evaluate to 0, and vice versa. Now, um, we can extend this um, idea to any number of um, variables, because the Morgan theorem works for um, any number of variables. And then we can generalize it and say that any max term with some index is the complement of its mean term with the same index and equivalently any mean term uh, with some index is the complement of the max term. And this will come in handy. Um, we will have exercise about this either next week or the following week in tutorials, I don't remember. Uh, but you will see how um, this is very handy to start taking functions and their complements. Now suppose you have a function, um, like the one I've shown you before, and for some reason you are interested in its complement. Why would, be, why would we be interested in a function's complement? Um, for example, in week 12, when we will um, come to implement our circuits using transistors, you will see that it's actually much easier and more efficient to work with complements of functions and of variables rather than um, the actual functions themselves. So knowing how to take easy complement of a function um, is a good idea. So there's um, two ways you can go about doing this with uh, mean terms and max terms. If you're just talking about mean terms, you take your function, the mean terms of your function, and then you, the complement will be choosing all the indices that were not in the original function's uh, mean terms expression. I'll show you an example. Alternatively, the other way to do it is instead of, um, if you have a function expresses a sum of mean terms, take the same indices 
as a product of max terms. And we just showed that um, this will give us each um, max term is the complement of its mean term. So if we use the same indices, you will get the complement of the function. Let's have a look at an example. So we have some function um, g of x, y, and z. And I did express it in, um, in, in a mean terms shortcut notation. Now, if I do give you um, an expression like this, g equals um, the sum of mean terms 1, 3, 5, and 7, you can automatically deduce the truth table just from this expression. And vice versa, if I throw at you um, a truth table, you can very easily just read the um, indices and come up with the sum of mean terms. Now I want to find the complement of this function. So if this is the function values here, its complement, oops, there you go, um, not g, will just be the complement of um, the function values uh, from here. So I can do it in two ways. I can either take, leave it as a sum of mean terms and say the complement of g as a function of x, y, and z will be the sum of mean terms of all the indices that were not in the original one. So I don't have 0, 2, 4, and 6. Another way of looking at this, by the way, is if you look at the um, complement column that I just um, drew here, you can see that these are now the indices um, of the places where the complement of G um, is now a 1. So two ways of looking at this. Now if I want to express um, the complement of G as a product of max terms, I said I can just take the very same indices as I had in the mean terms, so it will be the product of max terms with the same indices up there, which is 1, 3, 5, and 7. Sometimes it will be more convenient to work um, with a product of max terms. Sometimes it will be more convenient to work um, with the sum of mean terms. All right. Questions so far? So we now know what mean terms and max terms are, um, and it is important that you remember the definition. And we define how we express functions as sum of mean terms as, as a product of max term. Um, and again, if you're a bit observ observant, you will realize that um, doing it as um, sum of mean terms and product of max terms could be a little bit redundant. We may have more um, terms that we can care for we might be able to optimize um, the functions even further. And this is where um, a new um, term comes, sum of products as in opposed to sum of mean terms. And this is something you will see all the time. So sum of products is very similar form to sum of mean terms only the constraint that all the variables are present in every term, so um, in the case that we had three variables, we always had in every term x, y, and z, either in their regular or complementary form. So this constraint is now lifted. Um, sum of products means it's going to be um, sum, so or, between um, n terms or products. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you will have to have um, all the variables in each one of the terms. In fact, we probably will not have all of them. Now, the benefit of it, and that's the reason why we will see sum of products all the time, is you can take this, um, this expression and then implement a two-level circuit from it directly uh, from the expression. Now, we will talk more about um, two-level circuits week four, uh, but just to get to um, to let you know why we actually look in two-level um, circuit. So what does it mean to implement a two-level circuit? Two-level circuit means that um, the incoming signals will go through um, one level of gate. So it will go through, say, an OR gate. No, probably it will go through an AND gate. 
And then the output from all those end gates will go through one big OR gate, and this will be our function. As in opposed to, for example, signals going through OR gate, then some end gates, then some more end gates and OR gates, and go through um, more levels of um, more propagation through different gates. Now we talked about propagation delay um, in the last lecture and this is why we are interested in the two level circuit. Because this um, is usually the circuit with the um, least amount of propagation delay and therefore um, it will give us the fastest um, circuit we can and we can start switching the circuit or, or push more inputs more quickly resulting in a quicker circuit. There is, um, by the way, a downside to it. Um, we'll see um, two-level circuits do tend to, um, to have more, um, to consume more area on a chip because they will require more gates um, than multiple level, but they will be quicker. So there's always um, some sort of a trade-off, but we will, in this course, we will do a lot of work with two-level circuits. Um, in week four, in week four, we will um, show ways of um, coming up with multiple level um, circuits as well. Uh, questions? So here's an example of something of the form of sum of products. So we have three terms in it. Not all um, variables are present in every term. The first term only have not y. The second term is, in fact, a mean term, but it's just a term. And the third one, um, again, doesn't have the z variable. Um, and this thing will give us a sum of products. So the name kind of makes sense. Now, um, let me draw the circuit for you, uh, for this thing. And this will actually make it a bit more obvious why, um, why this is a two-level circuit. So, hey, did you get something wrong? Did I get something wrong? No? Okay. Um, this will be the first level, this will be the second level, and um, you can see I've been sort of slack because there are um, complemented terms coming into um, the circuit that you can argue, hey, why don't you have inverters with, which actually form another level. If I wanted to have not x and not z, I do have to take my, um, shh, uh, my true forms, x and z, and then pass them through inverters. Um, the reason why this is still called a two-level form is because in most technologies, um, we actually have both the true and the complemented um, values of the signals available to us, usually. Um, and this is why we usually don't bother with um, counting the, in the inputs, the, the, the inverses of the inputs, because they're sort of readily available there. Um, it is actually usually a byproduct of the rest of the circuitry uh, that happens to produce the complements. And again, you will see when we actually implement circuits, why this is so common to have the complements um, of a variable. Uh, so in this case here, we don't count this as a level, and we have a two-level design. Any signals coming in will propagate at most through one and two gates. Obviously, the not y term there uh, only have one gate to propagate through, um, and it will, um, the signal from y will obviously propagate to the output quicker. Um, now, just to mention, how is this related to some of mean terms? If you try to now write, you, you can write the truth table for this function, um, and then come up with um, the corresponding mean terms, which will um, end up with a larger circuit and a larger ex expression. Uh, but can I just by looking at this expression come up with how many mean terms am I going to end up with? How many places 
is the function um, equal 1 in the truth table. Well, it's important to realize that uh, when we have one variable missing from a term, it really means that this term, the third term that's missing, can come in either its regular or its complementary form. So when I write x, y, I really, it really is a shortcut notation for x, y, z or x, y, not z. So this will, in fact, cover two um, mean terms. This product here, the middle one, is already a mean term, so it only covers one uh, row in our truth table. Um, our not y term there actually encloses within it the four other combinations between x and z uh, possible. So this actually cover four different combinations in a truth table. Whenever um, y will be um, zero in our truth table, regardless of what x and, and z will be, the whole function will become a one. Because once y is zero, then not y evaluates to one and one or with anything else will make the whole function one. And then we can conclude that we have, um, well, it's not equal, but seven out of the eight different combinations will actually um, give me true for this function. Now, just be careful when you do something like this because you might have overlapping um, mean terms. This is sort of just an analysis that I've done very quickly now, but um, if, just as an example, this term here would have been x not y, then this term is actually overlapping with the not y um, by itself there, and it doesn't actually contribute any new information. And if you remember one of our identities um, that said um, x or x, y is just x, um, this is sort of where it comes from. If you can't quite see where this is all going or why things are the way they are, Next week we will learn how to represent all this in a graphical form in what's called corner maps. Um, and then these things will become more apparent and you will be able to see them and you get more of a feel of what sort of encloses other terms in it. Um, other questions? Yeah? Does each level have like one type of case? Um, in this standard form, yeah, I mean that's the idea of uh, when we have sum of products, for example, you will always have the first level being um, the product, so the end gate, and then the second level being the OR gate. Um, now in the next slide, we're talking about the opposite, the product of sums, you will have the exact opposite. You'll have the first level of OR gates, and then the second level will be the product gate, which is the end gate. But it's still like well, when you say, what, what do you mean by type? Like, it, it would either have all hand gates or all, all gates. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the idea of the standard forms. Um, in, the, in the lab, um, we will introduce the, um, the concept of FPGA. Anybody heard about FPGAs before? couple of people. FPGA, field programmable gate arrays. Um, you will work a lot with them in the lab, but what they are really are, shh, FPGAs are in a way programmable chips. They're, um, it's, it's a piece of hardware that you can actually program hardware on top of it. And the way um, FPGAs, most FPGAs actually work is they have a grid of N and OR terms. Um, so anything that you actually try to implement on them will be converted to um, sum of products, or product of sums, and they will go through this grid of um, end and um, so yeah, end and OR gates um, in a two-level design. Um, it's not as simple as this, but this is um, sort of the main idea behind this. Uh, just for completion, product of sums, that's the um, opposite of sum of products. Um, so the same idea as before, it's the same as um, product of max terms, only um, not every um, sum term needs to have all variables, same concept. Um, and then here's an example of um, a function that has 
uh, three different terms, three different um, sum terms in them, and they're all producted together or ended together. Um, very quickly, um, the circuit for something like this will now have its first level. I told you I always screw up drawing OR gates. We'll have its first level as OR gates, where this one will have not Y, Z. This one will have X, OR, Y, OR, not Z. And then another X term comes in. And this will be um, our function. So in this case, again, two level circuit, but the first level is OR gates. The second level um, are end gates. So now that we know about um, sum of products and product of sums, by the way, you will see um, sum of products all the time. Um, and by the way, you can abbreviate it as SOP, sum of products. And obviously, product of sums will be product of sums. Um, you will see sum of products coming up a whole lot more than product of sums. Um, it, it is actually more used. Um, it's more intuitive as well. Um, not to say that you don't need to you know product of sums, although you can always deduce it um, from sum of products, the, the whole concept. Um, what if I had a function that looks like x or not y or z. Is this sum of products or product of sums? Sum of products. Both? It is actually both. Because you can either think about it as sum of product, where each one of those uh, variable is just a product and then you have the sum between them. Or you can think about it as product of sums, where this is a sum, and it's just one um, you know, product with nothing, with a one, if you want. So this uh, special form is, by the way, both. Now we said um, those standard forms usually um, let us build um, optimized circuits. And then I ask you the question, but what does it mean to have an optimized circuit? We can optimize to different, um, different requirements. We might optimize a circuit for speed. We might optimize a circuit for power. We might optimize a circuit for size. Um, and then for cost, there's various um, things you can optimize for. And optimizing for one criteria will usually compromise um, the other um, options. It depends, it, it really is depending on the application. Uh, we need to define some way of um, giving a circuit a number that, will be, that we will be able to come up and say, this circuit is better than the other circuit. Why? Because it has a higher or a lower number because this number stands for something. Now there's many different ways you can actually come up with what we call the cost criteria. Um, cost criteria will tell us how good is the circuit? Well, how good for what? Um, one method, by the way, that we saw on Tuesday when I counted the number of literals in an expression, um, that gives us some sort of um, an idea of how good a circuit would be. If I have an expression with a lot of literals, and just to remind you, literals are either a variable or a complementary form of the variable. Um, if I have um, an expression with a whole, a whole lot of literals, it will probably, probably be less efficient to some criteria than an expression with very few literals. But if you actually look at what does it mean to have um, a lot of few literals, you actually realize that this is not quite a good cost criteria. We need something that makes a bit more sense. Um, and this is when I define the gate input cost of a circuit. Um, and I, I will try to convince you why this is a good measurement for um, a circuit. It is by no means the only uh, way you can evaluate a circuit. There's many other ways. Um, uh, gate input cost 
is the number of inputs to all the gates in my circuit regardless of whether they're near um, the circuit inputs or whether those gates are somewhere in the middle of my circuit um, in a, in a non-two-level circuit. So if I count the inputs uh, for all the gates, I, have, I get some number. Why is this number good for um, evaluating the circuits? Because usually, again, not all the time, but as a, as a first um, measurement of figure without doing too much analysis, the number of gate inputs will be proportional to the number of transistors that we will be used in the circuit. And um, in a lot of um, criteria, the less transistors you have, uh, the better the circuit because it's faster, it takes less space, um, it takes less power, it, takes, um, it costs less to produce. Um, so this, the number of transistors is a good measurement of how good your circuit is and the get input cost is a very easy way to estimate um, the order of um, number of transistors that you have. Now, here it says, um, and this is something I do want to emphasize, and I'll and I show you an example, um, only count distinct terms and complement literals. This means when you have an expression, you're trying to figure out what's the um, gates, uh, how many gates you have, Make sure you only count the distinct terms. And the easiest way to see what distinct means is if I have um, the, um, the term not x, for example. And for, this, um, for these purposes, by the way, I will not assume that I have um, the complement readily available. Um, I will assume that I only have the true form of the, of the uh, variables. So if I have the term not x, it means that I'm using one inverter to come up with not x from x. So this obviously have a gate input cost of one. There's only one gate with one input. But now anywhere else that will have not x in my circuit, I don't need another inverter. I can take the signal directly from here if I need not x again. And this is what I mean by distinct terms. And this is true not just for inverted signals, it also is true for uh, more complex um, terms. So if I had, for example, the term not x, y, z, if for some reason it comes up more than once in my expression, I don't need to recalculate this term. I already I can um, have an end gate that does all this for me and then just um, tap into the output of it um, as many times as I want, in theory. Um, all right, almost finished, last slide. Um, let's take a function, um, some random function. It's not a two-level function, as you can see. Uh, It's only a two-level function. Um, we'll start by um, counting the gate input cost directly from the circuit. Um, and by the definition, we will look at all the inputs that we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the gate input cost is nine. Now, if I only gave you uh, the expression itself and I asked, What's the gate input cost of this? Well, if you have no idea what you're doing, you could just draw the circuit and start counting um, those inputs, which will be a bit of a waste of time. Or you can look at the circuit and realize, uh, at the expression, and realize what does the, what's the corresponding circuit will be. So for example, if we have a term A, B, obviously we will have to end A and B together. So this will be two inputs. Similarly, in uh, the brackets here, we have D or E. It's an OR gate with two terms in it. We will then need to end um, whatever is in brackets with um, not C. So that's another end gate with two inputs. But this not C does not come for free, assuming we don't have the inverted signals. So we will need another um, input uh, for the inverter. And then to sum it all up, we have this OR gate that will attach the two sides of the circuit. So that's another two. 
And then we can just add them together, 2, 2, 2, 2, and 1, which is 9. So you can come up with it automatically. If we, by the way, had the first term A, B, not C, because I've already had um, not C available, I don't need to count that inverter twice. That's all for today. Um, I'll see you next week, Tuesday.